We're going to be in both a climactic section of Romans today and one of the most difficult chapters that deals with the nation of Israel. The doctrinal section of Romans is run through chapter 1 through 11. Now many have said that Romans 9 through 11, which is a literary unit, is an aside, that Paul deals with it as a parenthesis. But really I think it forms the capstone to his argument about justification by faith. Now I want to show you a graphic where I go over some of these introductory remarks. Notice, number one, that this is a literary unit. You cannot separate literary units. So chapters 9 through 11 form one closing section that deals with unbelieving Israel. What a drastic change occurs between the, the spiritual heights of Romans chapter 8 and the depression and agony of 9 through 11. This section basically deals with how did the Jews who had all the promises and privileges of God reject the Messiah. Chapter 9, though it's in a section on disbelieving Israel, is the strongest passage in all the Bible on the sovereignty of God, while chapter 10 is an equally strong passage on the free will of man. The concluding part of chapter 9 forms a summary of chapter 9 as well as the theme of chapter 10. Now chapter 11 is going to continue this same paradox between God's sovereignty and man's free will, and in the midst of this is Israel who had all the privileges but chose to reject God's Messiah. Now I think it's really important. I want to go down through verses 1 through 5, and then I want to, to look at a summary of the argument of all three chapters before I come back and deal with some of the particular passages. Now, notice where Paul is making a threefold vow here. He's saying, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, is bearing witness to this fact. Now, the word conscience is the idea of the inner moral sense in all men. Back in Romans uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, this inner moral consciousness. Now, when it's enlightened by the Holy Spirit, it can be trusted. Without the Holy Spirit, it cannot be trusted. So Paul's saying, God's witness to me, back in chapter 8, verse 16, is that I'm telling the truth. Notice what he's telling the truth about. I have a constant grief and a constant anguish in my heart. There is a threefold vow and there's a threefold brokenness here. Paul is not uh, taking any kind of sense of pleasure in the message he preached about the lostness of Israel. He, he is broken hearted over the fact that his natural kinsmen have rejected God's way of right standing, which is faith in the Messiah and not uh, in, in their regular way they were trying in works righteousness. Now, notice how far he goes in verse 3. I could wish myself to be accursed. Now, this is the word anathema. It means set apart for destruction. As the word holy means set apart for a, a particular task by God, anathema means set apart for destruction. Now, this prayer of intercession, the intensity is much like Moses' prayer in Exodus 32, 32, when he prayed for Israel after the golden calf experience. Two great intercessors. Now, you might want to see three passages where that term anathema is used. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 26, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, and Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Now, in verse 4, we're coming to the Israelites, the covenant name for God and the unique privileges that they had in being the chosen people of God. And here is a list of those privileges. Notice number one is sonship. Now the literal here is adoption. Paul's favorite metaphor to describe salvation is adoption. John's favorite metaphor to describe salvation is being born again. Notice God's glorious presence, we would call it the Shekinah cloud of glory. Then we have the special covenant or covenants. Uh, it's singular in Chester Beatty Papyri, manuscript B and D. I believe in one covenant. The giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, that'll be all the prophetic statements in the Bible, the patriarchs, and finally, the natural descent of the Messiah. The Messiah will come from the line of David. Notice, if you would, then, in verse 6, we begin a series of objections to this truth. Now, the reason for this is Paul's using a diatribe again, and what he's, he's going to do, he's going to teach the truth by the use of supposed objectors to what he's saying. Now, there's going to be several of these objectors. We're going to have one in verse 6, verse 14, verse 19, verse 30, and chapter 11, verse 1. These objectors really form the basis of Paul's logical argument. 
You see, here are the Jews, God's chosen people, with all of these advantages. They should have recognized Christ. They should have recognized the way of faith, and yet they didn't. And so Paul begins in chapter 9 through 11 to try to explain the paradoxical relationship between the chosen people and the unbelieving Jews of Jesus' day. Now, let me show you one more graphic real quick where we go through the entire argument, then I'll come back and pick up some of the particular tasks. The first objector is found there in verses 6 through 13. Has God's promise to Israel failed? Have the Old Testament promises proved to be invalid? And Paul will say no. Now, the second argument comes in verse 14. Is God unfair? Since man is the object of God's mercy or God's wrath, he is predestined. Um, is it unfair for God to, to be arbitrary like this? And that's verses 14 through 18. Then in verse 3, how does God find fault when no one can resist his will? We are almost puppets in a divine play. How can he uh, judge us for doing what he knows we're going to do? <clears throat> Excuse me, that's in verses 19 through 29. And then the next section is, why is Israel left out of God's new way of righteousness, our original way of righteousness, which Paul calls justification by faith. Now, that is all of chapter 10, which is summarized in chapter 9, 30 through 33. And then finally, has God disowned his chosen people? And that is what chapter 11 is all about. And chapter 11 is going to deal with the place of the Jews in this modern period, a very controversial and difficult passage. Now, with, with all those arguments, let's go back and see if we can pick up some of the unique features of each one. Now, in verses 6 through 13 is his first uh, objection. But it is not that God's word has failed, for not everybody that is descended from Israel really belongs to Israel. Now, here we have a play on the word Israel. First, we mean Israel, meaning Jacob. And then we mean not all of Jacob's descendants were ever truly right with God. Now, that's what all Israel's not Israel means. There's going to be a play on the word between the man Israel and his descendants and a play on national Israel, racial Israel, and spiritual Israel, the church. And that play is going to be all the way through here. And I must admit to you, I'm not always sure when national Israel is referred to and when spiritual Israel, the church, is referred to. Obviously, I am not a dispensationalist. I believe in one and only one covenant. I believe in one and only one people of God. And therefore, you'll see that um, in the way I interpret this. Now, uh, notice where it mentions not all are children of Abraham. And it goes into an example like this. It goes into the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. Now, you might want to see this not all is really Israel. Galatians 3, 7 through 9, and John 8, 37 through 44 becomes very important, I believe. You know, I have forgotten a real significant thing, and I think I want to go back and pick it up in verse 5 before I forget it. Notice where it says, The Christ has come, who is exalted over all, God blessed forever. Amen. I want to say to you, before I get too far from verse 5, grammatically, this can refer to the Father or the Son. Paul does not use theos for the Son very often, but he does use it. Acts 20, verse 28, and Titus 2, uh, 13. I believe Paul is calling Jesus God in this passage. Now, back to, back to the section I was on in 6 through 13. He uses Ishmael and Isaac, and then he comes down and uses the twin sons of Isaac, Esau and Jacob. Now, he uses those to show that it is God's sovereignty, not man's works or racial descent. It is God's promise and God's choice. Before these two sons, Esau and Jacob, could do anything good or bad, God chose the younger to serve the older. Uh, excuse me, the older to serve the younger, which is exactly opposite of Jewish tradition. Now, he did that to show that the sovereignty, the choice, the election, the predestination belongs to him and not to man's merit or man's works, okay? And here it is exactly in the text, back in verse 11, that God's purpose in accordance with his choice, election, might continue to stand, conditioned not on men's action, but on God's calling them. And there is the key phrase of predestination of chapter 9. Notice it says, there's a quote here from the Old Testament, she was told the elder will be a slave to the younger. Uh, as the scripture says, Jacob I have hated, Esau, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. This is a Hebrew idiom of comparison. It's a quote from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. 
It's also reflected in Deuteronomy 21, 15 and Genesis 29, 31 and 33 in relation to Leah and Rachel, Jacob's uh, wives. Now, it does not mean, like in the New Testament, when it says you've got to hate father and mother and love Jesus. That doesn't say you've got to hate father and mother. That's a Hebrew idiom comparison. Jesus has to be first. Jacob was first. Uh, Leah was not as loved as Rachel. It's an idiom of comparison. It seems a little harsh in English, but to Oriental people, they would understand completely what Jesus was saying. Now, in verses 14 through 18, another supposed objection. What are we then to conclude? Is it not that there is injustice in God, is it? Now, here is two men again, Moses and Pharaoh. God chose Moses to have mercy on him. And the quote here is from Exodus 33, 19. Now, the word mercy appears all the way through this passage. It appears in verse 15 uh, twice, verse 16, verse 19, or excuse me, 18, verse 23, and it appears at the end of chapter 11, verses 30, 31, and 32. The key of this whole section is God's election or predestination, God's sovereignty in mercy. Now, in the Septuagint, the term mercy is a translation of the Hebrew word hesed, which means God's covenant, no strings attached love to the Jewish people that now is extended to God's no strings attached covenant love in Christ to all men. And that's the play throughout here. Now, so mercy is the key. I will have mercy on any man I choose to have mercy on and take pity on any man I choose to take pity on. Now, here comes the other side. The flip side of mercy is wrath. And the example of that is Pharaoh. Now, if you look in verse 17, this is a quote from Exodus 9, 16. Now, in the, pardon me, in the Old Testament, several times it says Moses hardened his own, I mean, excuse me, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Uh, Exodus 8, 15, 32, and 9, 34. Then several times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 4, 21, 7, 3, 9, 12, 10, 27, and 11, 10. We're not playing on this two different examples in the Old Testament. We're using, we're in a passage on the sovereignty of God. God chose to love Moses. God chose to reject Pharaoh. And that's the idea of the text here. Now in verse 19, the next objection comes up. Well, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? This is perfect tense. It speaks of God's will that becomes operative and becomes a state. Now, what we're saying here is if that's true, if God chooses to love some and to have wrath on other, how can man be held responsible? Well, that's th then he uses the example of the potter and the clay. Now, it's not that man is just clay. It's the, it's the, relation, it's the metaphor of a potter can mold anything out of the clay he wants. The sovereign God can do anything he wants to with his creatures. And that's the idea here. I hope you'll look at your outline for many of the textual points. Okay? Uh, look at verse 23. So as to make known the riches of his glory for the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in ages past to share his glory. Oh, I believe in predestination. You ought to see Ephesians chapter 1, particularly verses 4 and 11. That's another passage of a strong, strong affirmation of the sovereignty of God. Boy, chapter 9 is strong on that. Then we come to several allusions, basically Hosea 2, 23, which is an allusion in, in context to the northern ten tribes, but here it refers to the Gentile people. Then in verses 27 and down through 33, we're talking about the universal plan of God. First is mentioned the covenant with Abraham, and that's in Genesis 15, 5, 22, 17, and 26, 4, that they'll be as numerous as the sands of the sea. And then it talks about that God's going to have mercy. Now, the next, the next question, the next move in the argument is found in 930 all the way through chapter 10. We're moving now from a summary of nine on the sovereignty of God into the paradox of the free will of man, which includes the Gentiles. And that's what's so amazing. Notice down in verse 32, it talks about the rock, the stone of stumbling. Now, here we have a use that's used of God originally, the rock, Psalms 18, but it came to be a messianic title. Uh, Genesis 49, 24. Uh, Psalms 118, 22, Isaiah 8, 14, 28, 16. Uh, in your outline, you'll see the book of Daniel and Matthew. So Jesus becomes the stone. The Jews stumbled over that stone. They rejected the stone, but God chose this stone as the foundation of faith, and that stone's the Messiah. So now we're moving from Israel, the chosen people, rejecting God's chosen way of salvation through Jesus of Nazareth, and now we're moving into free will. God is sovereign, but man has a free will. The free will of chapter 10 is in context 
related to the rejection of the Jews. God's offer of salvation is open, but they must respond to Jesus Christ. Uh, in many of these outlines of uh, plans of salvation, Romans 10 is an example of uh, freely trusting Christ. In context, it's the Jews, but it's wider than that. Now, we start out in chapter 10 then. Brothers, my heart's goodwill goes out for them, and my prayer to God is that they may be saved. Paul is no fatalist or determinist, though he hits strongly the sovereignty of God in chapter 9. Without explaining their relationship, he states as strong as anywhere in the Bible, there are more whosoever wills all than everyone in chapter 10 than anywhere else. So here is sovereignty right next to free will with no attempt at explanation. They are a paradox. Now, God's way of right standing versus the Old Testament way of right standing is found in verses 2 through 4 as it was found in the concluding section of chapter 9. The Jews were trying to be right with God by keeping the law through works. But God has revealed that the right standing is by faith through Christ, the recognition of our sin, our contrite, humble acceptance of God's provision. Now, the Old Testament was never meant to be a means of salvation. If you'll look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, the Old Testament's purpose, much like the Sermon on the Mount, is to show man his sinfulness, to bring him to a place of recognition of his need, and to admit his spiritual bankruptcy. All men are in need of God's righteousness through Christ. The law is simply a foil to show man his sinfulness. Now, you might well see Matthew 5, 17 and 18. The purpose of the law, it'll never pass away. But it is not a way to be saved, but it is God's will for man in society, and it continues to have a purpose of showing man his sinfulness. So it certainly will not pass away. Now, verses uh, six, 6 through 8 are a quote from Deuteronomy 30, 12 through 14, which talks about this way of claiming righteousness by self-effort. It's used of Christ in Ephesians 4, uh, 9 and 10, and you might want to see that relationship. Now, in verse 9 it says, if, third class conditional, with your lips you acknowledge the word homilageo, confess, publicly agree with, and there are many listings of this. Uh, I have them in your outline. There are several of them which public uh, profession of faith in Christ is so important. There are so many of those. That Jesus is Lord. This is the early church's public theological profession of faith, and I believe their baptism formula that connected the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus through the terms Jesus and Lord that are used in significant ways throughout the New Testament. Now, notice it says, believe in your heart. That shows it's not just theology. It's personal reception and faith that God has raised him from the dead. See 1 Corinthians 15. Now, let's see. Notice verse 11. No one. Notice down a little bit further. Verse 12. To all who call upon him. Look at verse 13. Everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. The universal element. Anyone, everyone, Jew, Gentile, who comes to Jesus can be saved. And that's the idea of this whole Romans 10. Now, in verse 14, we come to another question about hearing the message, and it go, it's the missionary emphasis of Israel and their rebuttal. Now, let's see. There are several Old Testament quotes. You can see them uh, in your outline. Now, verse 21 of chapter 10 really sets the stage for chapter 11. God offered his love to Israel. God offered his love to Israel. God offered his love to Israel, but Israel refused. The free will of man in chapter 10 was refused by Israel. So the question comes again in Romans 11:1. 1. I say then, God has not disowned his people, has he? Of course not. God's promise was to a man and to a nation. That nation began to more and more apostatize. God's plan or promise is unconditional, but man's response is conditional. Some Jews in Jesus' day responded, a remnant. The vast majority did not. There is coming a day when the majority of Jews will turn back to Jesus. Now, when that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, I don't know. But chapter 11 is saying that the Jews, to be saved, must come through Christ, and that God still has a plan for national Israel in the end time. Now, exactly what it is, I'm not certain. Let's look at it if we could. He says he's an Israelite, he's a Benjamite. You might well see Philippians 3, 5, where he lists all of his Jewish background. No, God has not disowned his people. For you see, God's name is involved. Now, here's the answer. Let me give you three aspects of his answer. In verses 1 through 10, 
he says, to answer to question one, there's going to be a remnant, a small group is going to believe throughout the church period. The second answer is, in verse 11 through 15, this blindness, this rejection of the Messiah is only temporary on Israel's part. And I would add a third reason here. The third one is, for God's namesake, God is going to work with national Israel because the promises he made them, not because they're such good people or special people or anything else, but God, because of his namesake, is still going to work on the part of national Israel. Now, I believe what we have described here in Romans 11 is a spiritual exile similar to the physical exile in the Old Testament. And that's this period of temporary blindness or hardness. Now, he's going to quote a scripture dealing with a, a Elijah back in 1 Kings 19.10 about Elijah saying, Oh, God, no one loves you. And God says, Yes, there is a remnant that believes in me. And that's the whole essence here of the next few verses about that remnant that believes is still available in Jesus' day. There were many Jews that did believe at Pentecost, many priests believed, and on and on. There are Jews that are accepting the Messiah today. Now, we go down through this and look at verse, uh, the end of verse 7. The rest have become insensible. Now, this is hardened. This is a medical term. You can see 2 Corinthians 3.14. They've become insensitive. So the scripture says, this is a quote from Isaiah 29.10, Deuteronomy 29.4. God has given them over to an attitude of insensibility. Now, this is a different word. It means an insect bite which so stimulates the body that it's oversensitized and can't feel the, 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 the sense. The Jews have had so much of the grace of God, so much of the promises of God, so much of the blessing of God, they become insensitive to God and have turned to ritualism, legalism, works. Now, let's see. Uh, okay, here's another quote about David. Um, and that's from Psalm 69, 22 and 23. Notice it talked about their rejection. Their eyes have been darkened. Aries passive imperative. They bend their backs. Uh, another Aries imperative. Now, here's verse 11. Is one of the purposes for the Jews' partial blindness. When the Gentiles are going to come in and the Jews are going to see the grace of God in the church, the grace of God in Gentiles, it's going to make them jealous. And Paul's hoping by the jealousy formed by God's blessing and love for the Gentiles, the Jews are going to be turned back to him. Now, I believe this last section, 14 through 24, shows me there, is, there was a problem in the church at Rome between Jews and non-Jews. Now, I'm not sure what that, what that problem was. Paul brings this whole section up, 9 through 11, for two reasons. To explain why the promised chosen people rejected the way of salvation. And two, to deal with the problem of Jewishness in the church of Rome. Now look at these verses. Verse 13, verse 18, and verse 25 will prove there was some tension in the church at Rome over national Israel versus the church. What it is, we're not sure. Now if you'll notice in verses 11 through 24, there are 10 conditional phrases that show that Israel always had a, an option but never took the right one. Um, they did not stumble so as to fall in utter ruin, did they? Of course not. On the contrary, because of their stumbling, salvation has come to the heathen peoples to make the Israelites jealous. But if their stumbling has resulted in the enrichment of the world and their overflow becomes the enrichment of the heathen peoples, how much richer will the result be when the full quota of Jews come in? Now, this full quota of Jews must be related to verse 25, where it talks about the full quota of the heathen. And I believe it must be related to verse 26, where it says, all Israel will be saved. Now, there's a real question, my friends. I wish I had a dogmatic answer, but after praying and studying the context, I'm not sure which it is. Some believe that all national Israel will be saved. Now, just as a side here. The Jews in Israel today are not racial Israel. They are a group of Jews that, that accepted Judaism in Central Europe, and they are not racial Jews. Most of the white-skinned Jewish leaders in Israel today are not racially Jewish. If this is true, then racial Israel is going to have a place and a plan in the eschaton. Now, I believe because of Galatians 6.16, and because of Paul's use of this in chapter 9, verse 16, about the church being spiritual Israel, or all Israel's not Israel, that's 9, 16. And then Paul calling the church the Israel of God, 
that maybe when it says all Israel, I mean all Israel will be saved, maybe we're talking about the full predestined number of both believing Jews, the remnant, and the Gentiles that accept Christ. Maybe that's what all Israel will be saved means. And I'm not real sure which one it really is. Now, Paul goes into a discussion here on the corporality of the saints. And you see that down about verse, uh, well, excuse me, I didn't skip the chapter. <laughs> I got so excited. Yeah, let me go back and pick up in verse, let's see. Well, in verses 17 and following is this unusual metaphor about the wild olive branches, being the Gentiles, are grafted into the natural olive tree, the Jews. The olive tree has always been a symbol of Israel. Now, look at verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, certainly he will not spare you. Now, this is corporate talking, corporal nation, corporate church. Friends, if the church ever leaves faith in the Messiah, they're going to be as rejected as the Jews that leave faith. The uh, key is faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Notice it mentioned the last closing part of this, verses 25 uh, down through 36. The blindness on Israel is temporary. The mystery uncovered has always been that God has one people, Jew and Gentile. See Colossians 1, 26 and 27, and Ephesians chapter 2. Everyone who God has chosen will be saved. They will be saved in one way, through faith in Jesus Christ. Be it natural Israel, be it spiritual Israel, only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. The key is mercy, and the theological point is the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. It's a very difficult section. I wish I had longer. Your outline is more complete. God bless you. I'll see you again same time, same place next week.